Hi, everyone. Welcome to the opening night of 2017. Thank you all so much for coming out to help us warm the house. I'm Annetta Black, I'm the curator of Odd Salon, and I just wanted to start now by doing the thing that we really need to start the year with, which is thanking our new hosts at Public Works. Will everyone join me in raising a glass? Thank you for so quickly accommodating us and making us feel right at home. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'd also like to thank all of tonight's volunteers, Beth, Egan, Ryan, Arthur, Josh, Kate, Matt, and Barbara. We always have volunteers that help us um, make things go here, but we also have a few extras. We always have Ronnie shooting, and John is doing video, and Marcus is taking photographs, and Steen is doing sound. So um, thank you, all of you guys, for making this thing go. It's, uh, it's a lot more than just the people that you see on the stage. Um, and also, there is a little team of partners. I'd like to thank Trey and Tamar. Um, and we have a new partner this year that a lot of you have already seen and met, and she makes our amazing little tiny um, Harvey friends, uh, Isolde. So everyone, please welcome Isolde to the partnership. She's, she's going to be running our cocktail hour shenanigans upstairs. Um, so um, we're really excited as we begin this new year. We started to think about what our, what our inspiration is as we go forward. And last year, we were looking to... Um, mid-century uh, sort of adventure magazines for our theme. And this year we're looking to, to collections of wonders and marvels. Um, the stories that we tell on the stage are true, or at least as true as history permits. But we look to these collections for inspiration in their sense of delight in the strangeness of the natural world, for their enthusiasm for science and ancient history, for marvels of engineering, <laughs> And <laughs> engineering and unusual happenings. And we hope to bring that to the, to the stage this year, which is one of the reasons why the, the themes are kind of accommodating this sense of wonder. Um, we also took this as our inspiration in our new artwork for this year. And we want to thank Rich Black for his incredible artwork to kick off this year. He's amazing. Um, this inspiration came from uh, turn of the century Book of Marvels um, and four of, our favorite, four of our favorite stories from history. Um, before we begin the talks, I want to ask you guys to do me a favor, and I'd like you to please stand if you've been to Odd Salon before. <laughs> That's a lot of you. Okay. Have you been here before 2015, or before 2016? So in 2015, stay standing if you were here in 2015. Please stay standing if you came to our first year in 2014. Oh my God, thank you guys for sticking with us from our, uh, our rocky beginnings to now. Um, okay, you can, you can sit down. And then I would like to ask everyone who has been a speaker for Odd Salon to stand. <laughs> there are a lot of you. And then stay standing if you are a fellow of Odd Salon. There are 51 of you as of now as well. So uh, this is what it means to be going into our, our fourth year, and it means so much to have this long-standing community. But now, I'd like to ask you to stand if this is your first time here. And I want everyone to join me in welcoming everyone who has come here for the first time. And you can help them out with a little bit of ships and science, because it can be a little weird and shouty uh, your first time. <laughs> So real quick, for those of you who are new to this, how it works, uh, tonight we'll be sharing six short stories inspired by the odd corners of history, science, art, and adventure. Our speakers are both experts and enthusiastic amateurs, telling stories not to brag about their own experience or accomplishments or to try and sell you exciting new technology, but to revel in the strangeness of true stories to indulge in the joys of research and find connections and inspiration from our shared past. And we don't really like a polite and quiet audience. Our speakers like it when you make a little bit of noise, and we have a strange relationship with maritime vessels that sometimes yeah. <laughs> requires an odd outburst. And finally, this stage is your stage. Our speakers come from our audience and our extended community. So if you'd like to speak, right now we're actually curating two salons that are coming up in April on the themes of crisis and creature, and we'd love to hear from you. There's a link on the website where you can fill out a thing, and we also have a guest book um, over in the corner with Matt that you can fill out a speaker, a speaker form. So if you have an idea for a story that you think might fit one of those themes, 
let us know and come and come and join us. And tonight, please feel free to tweet and gram and share and all the things. Phones are phones are welcome. Okay, so uh, first, excuse me, it's very awkward. Um, <laughs> Okay, so tonight our theme is badass, and you may have noticed the tiny little elephant hiding out in the top of our, our banner, and I've gotten a few questions about why the elephant, you know, why elephants and not emus, because emus were the obvious choice. Um, and I know, I, it seems like a stretch, but I would like you to hear me out on why we have the little elephant there. So tonight I'd like to start us off by taking us back to ancient Rome, to the era of the Republic, before the turn to empire and the decline. Rome in its like kickoff startup phase. <laughs> I'm gonna mispronounce all the Latin, I'm just gonna tell you right now. Carthago de lenda est, or Carthage must be destroyed. It's a direct and to the point quote, but it lacks the poetry that we're used to from most of the quotes that come down to us through the centuries. Um, it's not wani wadi wiki, I came, I saw, I conquered Julius Caesar. It's, it's really got the, the poetry. It doesn't have the wit of nullum magnum ingenium sine mixtura de mente fuit, where there is no great genius with some touch of madness, which is Seneca quoting Aristotle. And it doesn't have the modern relevance of in vino veritas. <laughs> in wine truth. So why has it made it this far? Why do we even know, why do we even know this phrase? Why has it come down through his, history so, uh, and become so common that a writer like Isaac Asimov would use it as a motif in one of his stories? It's mostly through the sheer power of repetition by this guy, um, Marcus Porcius Cato, usually known as Cato the Elder. Um, he was obsessed with Carthage. Carthage in the third century BC was the rival upstart nation to the young Rome and its power base was along the African, the North African coast of the Mediterranean and rising up into the bottom of the Iberian Peninsula of what is now Spain. Cato, Cato the Elder was absolutely obsessed with destroying them. He was known not just for repeating the phrase, Carthage must be destroyed, but he basically made it his tagline. He ended great speeches about Carthage, about destroying things, but he also ended random other speeches with Carthage must be destroyed. Like, <laughs> we're raising taxes on wheat and Carthage must be destroyed. And he did this to the point of almost absurdity. Other writers wrote about how he, he just was like obsessed with destru the destruction of Carthage. And you have to ask like why? Why? And the answer is because elephants. Obviously. Obviously. Okay, so before we go there, I want you to imagine a thing. I want you to imagine that you're in Spain. Lovely. Um, and you have some elephants. Let's say 37 of them. Congratulations. For, for reasons, you need to get them from Spain to Italy, but with as few people as possible knowing about the elephant, because like, it's a big surprise party in Italy, and you need to get the elephants from here to there, minimum number of people knowing. So you have a lot of options, like you have ferries, you have trains, you have all these like really nicely paved roads, you have heavy equipment options. You can plan it out ahead with satellite maps. You can call ahead and have elephant snack depots set up along the way. You have the advantages of modern medicine for possible elephant injuries or elephant-caused injuries. <laughs> but if we're honest about it, if any of us were told tomorrow that we needed to move 37 elephants from Spain to Italy, we would still be faced with all of the ways that it could go horribly wrong. Um, elephants probably, possibly, don't like ferry rides. Um, they eat up to 700 pounds a day, so that's a lot of like food depots that you have to set up. And hiding 37 traveling elephants is like a whole other bag of cats. Bag of, bag of elephants is a like, really bag of thing. So, I wanna take you back to that vision of traveling elephants and all the logistics and all the planning and all the elephant food and, the place, and place those plans in 218 BC because that's when Hannibal Barca, the Carthaginian military commander, led an army of men, probably as many as 30,000 to 60,000 men, uh, about 15,000 horses and 37 elephants overland from southern Spain up north into what is now, in Fr now France through the Alps and down into Italy to surprise the enemy with war elephant doom. It was the memory of these unlikely elephants that drove Cato to madness. I mean, if we don't destroy them now, what are they going to come with next? It's going to be emus. <laughs> so clearly, Carthage has to be destroyed. 
Side note, I feel like I really can't tell the story without talking about some of the exciting science that's happening. There's some, it, there's some very exciting microbial poop-related science. Um, so for centuries, the kind of people who argue about this sort of things have been arguing about exactly what route Hannibal took across the Alps because it's a, it's a, very, unlikely, a very unlikely kind of situation and no one has ever conclusively proven one pass or another path. And there were a lot of like uh, warring tribes to prevent you from taking one from one route or another one. But in 2016, um, a group from York University in Toronto published their findings on a mass animal disposition <laughs> at Col de Traverset near Grenoble, France. So they followed clues from the original, the original sort of travel narrative that came out in the years after Hannibal's, Hannibal's uh, journey and determined a potential location from rock falls and other monuments that were, that were in the way. And they found a viable campsite for a reasonably giant army and a bunch of animals and they dug down and they used microbial genetic analysis of the soil and pollen analysis and a bunch of other stuff. And they were able to determine that there was a, a layer of disturbed soil that dates to the appropriate date that was full of the kind of microbes that you find in um, horse tongue. So they think they, found, they think they found the right place, but it's not totally settled. They're still working through all the details. And according to the papers, they said, <laughs> in exciting archaeological news. There's even the possibility of finding an elephant tapeworm egg, and that would be the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, <laughs> which is filed under archaeology as super glamorous. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, back to Hannibal and his badass elephants and Cato the Elder freaking out all the time and yelling about Carthage. So you might think that based on, on his repeated, almost hysterical invocation of doom, that Hannibal won with his elephants. Hannibal did not win. I mean, he successfully made it through the Alps. He came through the Alps in 16 days, which seems insane even by modern standards. And uh, he brought these monsters of myth and legend down from the mountains into northern, into northern Italy and terrified everyone and kicked ass in the first battles. But eventually, over time, in the Second Punic War, he was defeated. So why was Cato so obsessed? They won. Rome won. Rome trounced Carthage. Why did this statesman panic over Carthage? And how, why is it that it is still something that we get today? And the answer is because Hannibal and his elephants were badasses. Being a badass is not about who wins. It's about those who fight with uncommon valor. They persevere. They encourage others to take up the fight even against an unconquerable foe, against the tyrant, against overwhelming odds. History is full of these stories of badasses, and we've talked about a lot of them here before. We've talked about Josephine Baker and Hedy Lamar, St. Olga of Kiev, and La Maupin, who inspired our little Harvey tonight. And tonight we'll be looking at more stories to inspire our own inner badasses. So the invocation that I would like to begin this evening with is not only the echo of the memory of elephants that is Carthago de Lenda Est, but the phrase most often attributed to Hannibal purportedly when he was challenged by his generals at the foot of the Alps about how exactly they were going to make their way through. How, sir, do you plan to get these elephants through those mountains? And his answer was, Iam invenium aut fossium, or something like that. Um, I will find a way, or I will make one. So I would like to raise my glass tonight to those who make the way to the elephants. So it is my very great honor to welcome this evening's speakers to regale you with stories of daring and honor and reckless adventure and angry birds. Please welcome Leonard Appleson, Eva Galperin, Stuart Gripman, Justin Quimby, Seth Rosenblatt, and Casey Selden to the stage this evening. And to start us off, Leonard Appleton is going to tell us a story about Theodore Roosevelt and the River of Doubt. Please welcome Leonard. Mm -mm. Friends, our tale begins in 1912 when two-term president Theodore Roosevelt was running for an additional third term. Now, as Roosevelt was stepping out of his automobile to deliver a speech, an assassin ran up and fired from five feet away. Two bullets penetrated Roosevelt's muscular and tattooed chest. Roosevelt proceeded to open his jacket, revealing this bloody shirt. He then exclaimed, it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. 
uh, Roosevelt went on to read his 54-page speech for one hour and a half as blood gushed out his chest holes. Why? Because the man was obviously a badass. We're talking about a guy that had ridden a horse into battle, busted up the railroad truss, and had gone blind in one eye while boxing in the fucking White House. Uh, it's true. Uh, Roosevelt seemed unstoppable, yet he still lost the 1912 election to Woodrow Wilson because sometimes election results don't go our way. Uh, yeah, Roosevelt was absolutely devastated by that loss, and he dealt with that devastation the only way he knew how, through physical hardship and danger. Uh, Roosevelt resolved to travel deep into the Brazilian jungle. He would cross the mighty Amazon, but he wouldn't do it like some tourist punk, funk, you know, going down a well-trodden trail. Oh no! He resolved to go down a completely unknown river, the Rio de Duvida, the river of doubt. So cold because nobody knew where it led or how many hundreds of miles of jungle to terrain it crisped and crossed. This was a black spot on all maps. The river had only been discovered in 1909 by Colonel Candido Rondon, Brazil's greatest explorer. Now in his 1909 expedition, Rondon had stumbled upon the river, the start of the river, but he had to turn back because at this point nearly a quarter of his men were dead. Uh, Rondon's expeditions were actually infamous for their very high casualty rate. Uh, despite this, or maybe because of it, uh, Roosevelt decided he would team up with Rondon. They would traverse the unknown river together and put it on the map. Uh, when friends and her family uh, heard of Roosevelt's plans, they were horrified. They were pretty sure that the 55-year-old ex-president with no jungle exploration experience would not be coming back alive. Uh, to this, Roosevelt responded, I have had my full share. And if it is necessary for me to leave my bones in South America, I am quite ready to do so. Uh, uh, on February 27th, 1914, after two months of rigorous overland jungle travel, Roosevelt reached the opening to the River of Doubt. He was accompanied by his 24-year-old son, Kermit, by Colonel Rondon himself, and not like the frog. Although, <laughs> yeah, who am I kidding? We're all thinking of the frog. Uh, and uh, yeah, he had, uh, <laughs> he had like 19 other men by his side. As they paddled off in their seven dugout canoes into the unknown, Roosevelt began to realize for the very first time that his campaign, his expedition was in serious, serious trouble. You see, the expedition's quartermaster had been this man, Anthony Fiala, who would go down in history as the most incompetent explorer of the 20th century. Uh, Fiala had led a 1904 expedition to the North Pole that ended in total disaster. Uh, he and his men got stuck in Arctic ice for two cold years, uh, mostly due to his incompetence and poor, poor planning. In a similar vein, as Fiala was picking out supplies for the Roosevelt Rondon expedition, he packed plenty of fancy teas and sweet savory jams and lots of condiments and containers full of olives, uh, but he packed very little meat. And by the time the food shortage was discovered, it was way too late to turn back. Uh, Roosevelt began to realize that he might run out of food before he ran out of river. Uh, he would have to go down the river of doubt as quickly as possible in order to, you know, not starve. Uh, but there was a problem with going down the river quickly. This is an actual photo taken during the Roosevelt Rondon expedition. Uh, the River of Doubt is not a friendly river. It twists and turns to some exceedingly violent rapids. Uh, normally, protocol dictates that when you're exploring an unknown river and you encounter rapids and you don't know where the fuck they go, you park your canoes on the side of the river, lift them up, and carry them to calmer waters. Uh, this takes time, particularly if your canoes, like Roosevelt's, weigh 800 pounds each. Uh, Roosevelt didn't have the luxury of time, so he began to cut corners uh, that would encounter rapids, and Roosevelt and his men would go, well, they don't look that bad. Maybe it'll be okay. It'll be fine. And no, that's not the way this shit works. 
as Roosevelt found out on March 15th as he watched in absolute horror when a canoe carrying his son Kermit, two porters and weeks worth of food, plummeted over the edge of a 30-foot waterfall. Roosevelt rushed to the bottom of the falls and discovered the canoe shattered. There was nothing but debris and the rocks, no bodies to be found. Uh, Roosevelt's son would eventually reemerge from the murky waters, as would one of the porters. Second porter, Simplicio, was never seen again. Uh, he was the expedition's first casualty. Uh, he would certainly not be the last. Uh, the very, <laughs> it's not funny, people died. <laughs> well, <laughs> our very next morning, while the men were busy trying to rebuild the lost canoe, uh, Colonel Rondon went for a little jungle stroll with his closest companion, his dog Lobo. Uh, Lobo heard the howl of a holler monkey in the trees and he ran into some bushes and he let out a sharp yelp and then when Lobo uh, came out of the bushes there were two five foot long arrows jutting out his sides. Lobo! Uh, Rondon could hear from the depths of the jungle the sound of human whistling and chanting. He took his rifle, fired into the air, and ran the fuck back to camp, uh, as one would do. Uh, this marks the first recorded uh, interaction between Westerners and the fierce indigenous Sintalarga tribe. Uh, the Sintalarga are not a nice the nicest of tribes. Uh, they have been known to massacre intruders by the dozens as recently as 2004. Uh, at the time of the Roosevelt drone and expedition, they also practiced ritual cannibalism. Uh, when they killed an enemy in the jungle, they would section off the edible parts, arms and legs, and the soft flesh over the belly. They would grill it up of an open fire and take it home for their wives to slice and cook. Uh, according to Sintalarga culture, the bigger and girthier the enemy, the more honorable it was to consume him, which is why the 220-pound ex-president would make for a most honorably delicious prize. Uh, so after the encounter, Rondon would have guards posted at the camps each and every night. Yet not even the armed guards could defend from the jungle's most insidious killer, the mosquito, carrying tropical disease. On March 28th, Roosevelt began to experience the bone-chattering chills and burning fever associated with malaria. Uh, his illness was further exasperated by a cut on his knee that got infected and by the constant hunger. At this point, the expedition was down to like two, three crackers a day for... <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were literally starving. Uh, the constant hunger led to conflict. On April 3rd, two porters got into a fight over some rations. One of the men picked up a gun and shot the other dude straight through the heart. Uh, Roosevelt was shivering and sweating in his tent when he heard the gunshot ring out. He realized what had happened, grabbed the nearest rifle, and ran out looking for the murderer. Roosevelt was hold, like overheard to pronounce, and I quote, he who kills must die. Uh, the murderer, fearing, uh, fearing the worst, ran off into the jungle, and Roosevelt was unable to carry out his summary execution. Uh, the leaders of the expedition made the call to leave the man behind, abandoning him to what was surely a grisly and lonely jungle uh, death. Uh, the horror of all this violence basically obliterated the rest of Roosevelt's health and strength. The very next night, he collapsed in total uh, delirium. In a semi-conscious state, he began to recite over and over and over again a single stanza by the mad poet Calvin Coleridge. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where off the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to men, down to a sunless sea. Uh, the next morning at dawn, Roosevelt came to, and he realized he did not have the strength to carry on, and he did not want to be a burden to his men. Uh, Roosevelt always carried vit with him a vial filled with a single a lethal dose of morphine, and he decided to swallow the poison now. He called Rondon into his tent to make his goodbyes and said, the expedition cannot stop. On the other hand, I cannot proceed. You go on without me. Uh, Rondon looked Roosevelt in the eyes and calmly replied, 
let me point out that this is called the Roosevelt Drone Doan Expedition, so we cannot possibly split up. Uh, Ron Doan and his men convinced Roosevelt that if he offed himself, they would be forced to carry his heavy, rotting carcass through the jungle back to civilization. And Roosevelt uh, hung on. Uh, by some miracle on April 15th, they encountered some rubber tappers on the lower edge of the river with whom they could trade for food. I cannot emphasize enough that they would have been fucked without that. They were out of food. They would have been dead. So through sheer luck and sheer willpower, the men survived. Uh, Roosevelt and Rondon successfully mapped the River of Doubt, all the 400 miles it covered, and the River of Doubt was renamed by the Brazilian government to the Rio Roosevelt. Uh, this is a photo of the renaming ceremony, and I want to point out how thin and haggard Roosevelt looks. The man had lost over 50 pounds over the, the expedition, and his uh, health would never recover, and five short years he would be dead. Many historians believe directly as a result of the expedition. Upon learning that in 1919 Roosevelt had passed on in his sleep, the sitting vice president was heard to say, death had to take him sleeping, for if Roosevelt had been awake, there would have been a fight. Uh, I mean, no. Nah. So these, these are powerful words, but to me, they don't quite ring true because as we all know, out on the river of doubt, Roosevelt had nearly taken his own life. I mean, look guys, the man was undoubtedly one of the biggest badasses of history, yet even he was nearly destroyed, nearly broken by the infinite horror of the jungle. And yet he persevered. He carried on. He reached his river's terminal point, which is why I would like to raise my glass and offer up a toast to conquering our rivers and doing away with all internal doubt. Cheers! Thank you, Leonard. Okay, so um, when we began this, I asked all of tonight's speakers to tell me um, the most badass thing that they've ever done. And Leonard told me that he was in the Amazon himself and he was bitten by piranhas in the Amazon. But not only that, he also once screwed up skydiving and plummeted to the earth. So that's, that's two. I'm not sure if that's badass or just like lucky to not be dead. And then the third one is that he illegally trekked to a monastery in Tibet while dodging Chinese military outposts. So that's pretty good. Um, there are slips of paper that I think Azolda is, has around for you to to tell us your most badass moments. I'm going to read a couple of them. Um, one of them is um, that said, I wrecked my bike as a kid and completely knocked myself out and woke up, woke up and continued on my day. And <laughs> somebody else wrote that they um, pulled out one of their own teeth in order to intimidate a member of a rival volleyball team. <laughs> Very impressive. Very impressive. That's a commitment to the gig. Okay. Um, now I would like to welcome to the stage um, Eva. Um, Eva was once attacked on the street by a stranger after dark. Um, he punched her, and she punched him in the throat, and he ran away. <laughs> Please welcome Eva to the badass stage. So the pain. I always have to take this down a little bit. <laughs> Here we go. So, uh, I've got a question for everybody. How many of you here uh, have a degree in art history? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but I'm going to talk to you about Baroque painting anyway. And I'm going to begin with a, a little bit of a, of a mental image that I go through when I try to remember where the Baroque era belongs in history. The era that includes this woman. So what you do is you start at the Renaissance with Donatello and Michelangelo and all the other Ninja Turtles and you... <laughs> And you keep going, and if you've hit Rococo and everything gets super Marie Antoinette, you've gone too far. <laughs> so one of the greatest painters of the Baroque era is the woman right up on this slide, and her name is Artemisia Gentilici. Uh, 
you may notice that she does not have a ninja turtle named after her. Not even an intrepid journalist or a rat. And that is for approximately 400 years because uh, her name was largely forgotten and uh, her fame really only returned uh, in the 20th century with the rediscovery of her work, which we will talk about in a moment. So, Artemisia Gentilici. You are in Rome. It is about 1590 blah. And uh, <laughs> very vague. This is history, ladies and gentlemen. And the 15-year-old Artemisia has just painted this Madonna. Uh, the Madonna on the left is believed to be Artemisia's first painting, unsigned, uh, completed very young. Uh, it's thought to be based on a Madonna uh, drawn and painted by her father, uh, Orazio uh, Gentilici, who was also a famous painter. Uh, there is also some argument that it might be the Madonna on the right. But either way, this is some pretty advanced stuff for, say, high school age. Let me tell you, I was mostly doodling on my binder at the age of 15, 16. She was already kicking some very serious ass. Um, this is the lute player, uh, completed by Artemisia at the age of 17, when she was done with her apprenticeship. Um, this is also called uh, St. Cecilia for reasons entirely unknown to me. Uh, <laughs> check out the non-idealized appearance and high contrast chiaroscuro influenced by Caravaggio. Uh, as usual, uh, the attribution is kind of muddy and some art historians who don't believe that Artemisia was a great painter are like, oh, this is totally her dad's work. You know, because it's super advanced. This is the next known painting done by Artemisia Gentilici. Uh, it's called Susanna and the Elders. It is her first signed work. She completed it at the age of 17. Uh, and it tells the biblical story of a time uh, at, at a time when women were mostly limited to painting still lifes and portraits. Um, and she's not just painting a biblical figure. She's doing like a full twisted nude, which is basically the hold my beer while I do this of Baroque painting. This is the sort of thing that you normally, you know, see on the Sistine Chapel. But here she is, 17, busting out the twisted nude. Um, Susanna is a... And you may wonder why Susanna. Uh, Susanna is a hot Hebrew chick uh, in, uh, from the Bible uh, who was falsely accused by lecherous voyeurs. Um, as she's bathing in the garden, having sent her attendants away, uh, two creepy elders spy on her. On her way home, they accost her and threaten to claim that she was meeting with a young man in the garden unless she agrees to have sex with them. Plus ça change. Uh, being righteous, uh, she refuses to be blackmailed by these creeps. Uh, because patriarchy, she is immediately arrested and about to be put to death. When some guy named Daniel, because I think this is the book of Daniel, comes along <laughs> and insists that the elders should maybe be questioned before they put an innocent to death. Um, the elders in their, uh, in their testimony cannot agree on the size and type of the tree under which Susanna met her lover. Having been caught in a lie, the elders are put to death, Susanna is set free, and justice! <laughs> so basically this painting is about sexual harassment. Um, to show you how different Artemisia's approach to this whole Susanna and the elders thing, uh, this is the same subject painted by Guido Reni in 1620. See how much less annoyed Susanna looks? Clearly this was painted by somebody who had never been harassed by elders. <laughs> Here's the same subject painted by Alessandro Allori a few, uh, few years before, where Susanna has gone from annoyed to uh, flirtatiously removing the elder's head from her crotch. <laughs> now, right around this time, uh, Artemisia is spending a lot of time thinking about sexual harassment by elders um, because she meets uh, Agostino Tassi, uh, the guy who made the painting up here. 
this is the fleet of Aeneas. It's sort of a seascape. Uh, he also does a lot of sort of really boring stuff with perspective. Um, he worked in Rome with Artemisia, Artemisia's father and spent a lot of time around the Gentilici house. Uh, Orazio allegedly asked his friend to tutor the young, his young and talented daughter, and he obliges by spending months harassing her, and when he finally manages to get alone with her, raping her. So, Artemisia later gives a very detailed account of the rape, which I think we really don't need to get into here, uh, and it included her grabbing a knife and saying that she would kill him for dishonoring her, so she felt a little strongly about this. Um, what does this human garbage fire do next, I hear you ask? <laughs> he promises to restore her honor by marrying her. And this is tricky because he's already married. And, but Artemisia is 17, so, so she believes him. And they have a few more sort of consenty encounters uh, until after months of, I promise I'll marry you, baby. Uh, she's finally had enough. And uh, Tassi says it's never going to happen. And the gentilly, she say... I'll see you in court. <laughs> so the gentle issues take Tassio to court for the rape. Uh, we know a lot about this because this trial, uh, most of this transcript still exists. Um, it was published in Italian in 1981 and English in 1989. And if you think rape trials are tough on victims now, they've got nothing on 17th century Rome. Uh, where Artemisia was subjected to repeated public gynecological exams uh, in order to prove that she was no longer a virgin and forced to, ju to endure judicial torture. You may ask yourself, what is this judicial torture? Uh, she had to go through the uh, ordeal of the Sibyl, or Sibel. Sibele? I am going to ruin a lot of Italian over the course of this talk. Uh, so this torture involved placing cords around each of the victim's fingers and tightening them around the joints with slip knots until they started to crush her fingers. The theory was that the victim would be unable to lie when forced to testify in such a manner in front of their alleged abuser. Artemisia sticks to her story, even raging, this is the ring you give me? These are your promises? And I have to admit, I am super impressed by anyone who can manage sarcasm while being tortured. <laughs> Tazio, in a move that will surprise no one, was not subjected to torture at all. So, <laughs> let us take a moment to appreciate Agostino Tazi, human garbage, because he starts lying like the gold medal champion in the lying Olympics. He insists that not only did he never have sex with Artemisia, he's never been alone with her in her house. He accuses every other man in sight, including her father, of having screwed her instead. He says Orazio whored her out to his friends for as little as a loaf of bread. He calls Artemisia an insatiable whore and calls in his friends to testify that they've slept with her. Uh, he insults her skills as a painter, saying that Arezio brought her in as a tutor because he had to teach her perspective. Uh, the lies get so bad that the judge starts publicly berating him for his flights of fancy. So, we're not done. Uh, Tazi was convicted, but he got off lightly. Uh, he was given a choice of five years service in the, in the galleys, so, so the, the big ships, or a five-year exile from Rome. Uh, further accounts of his life as human garbage include the fact that he had been to prison twice before, uh, he had raped and then married his first wife, he had been convicted of incest for raping and impregnating his sister-in-law, and finally, Tazi's wife was missing and he was suspected of having arranged her murder. So, you know, good guy. Nice guy to keep around the house. Uh, accounts vary as to whether he ended up serving a year or four months or he got off entirely. Um, but records do show that four months later, human garbage was back in Rome. And this was kind of okay because Artemisia had been married off to a family friend, also a painter, possibly in debt to Artemisia's father, uh, in order to preserve her honor, and they moved to Florence, where they had a daughter, and Artemisia's career really began to take off. So. It's like you've guessed the next part. So this is Judith slaying Hol uh, Holofernes. 
Holofernes. I'm gonna. I promised I would mess up a lot of things. Um, <laughs> by uh, by Caravaggio. It was painted in 1599. Uh, the story of Judith, much like uh, Susanna and the Elders, was a very popular one for biblical paintings. Uh, Holofernes was an Assyrian general who was about to destroy Judith's hometown of Bethula. Uh, Judith, along with her maid servant, sneaks into Holofernes' tent when he's passed out drunk and chops off his head. Uh, she brings the head back as a trophy to the townspeople, because she's dope. <laughs> and the townspeople go on to victory over the leaderless Assyrians. Uh, Caravaggio was a big influence on Gentile She, as you will see in a moment, but she painted her own version, and it looked like this. Artemidia's Judith was, let's just go with self-portrait. <laughs> and while we don't have any extant portraits of a Augustino Tassi human garbage fire, let's just say there was a strong resemblance. <laughs> Both paintings are strongly realistic, employ chiaroscuro, uh, but Caravaggio's Judith is squeamish and a little grossed out. It's almost like Holofernes' head pops off by accident. Um, in Artemisia's painting, Judith is really putting her back into it. <laughs> While her maid holds the guy down, there's blood spraying everywhere. And the expression on Artemisia's uh, face um, is described by uh, her premier biographer as a cathartic expression of Artemisia's private and perhaps repressed rage. I'm going with not so repressed. <laughs> The art critic Tom Lubbock refers to this as a slasher painting. <laughs> For years, this painting was hung in the shadows of the Uffizi Gallery in Florence so as not to shock audiences. <laughs> in Florence, Artemisia was a big success. She was the first woman accepted to the Academy of, uh, of Arts and Drawing, uh, which is pronounced in Italian and which I will not pronounce in Italian. Uh, <laughs> she maintained good relations with the most respected artists of her time. She gathered the favors and protection of influential people, including Cosimo de Medici, uh, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, and the Grand Duchess, uh, Christina of Lorraine. Uh, she had a lengthy written correspondence with Galileo uh, Galilei, a guy that may have come up once or twice in these talks. Um, and during this time, she painted a second version of Judith, as well as this self-portrait of herself playing the lute while looking spectacularly unimpressed. <laughs> Unfortunately, her painter husband had a habit of spending all the money, so they split in 1621, and she returned with her daughter to Rome. In Rome, her work continued to be respected. Uh, she was associated with the Academy of Design, where she was celebrated in a portrait carrying the inscription. Lots of Latin here. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> to paint a wonder is more easily envied than imitated, which is to say hate has got to hate. <laughs> Visiting French artist, uh, Pierre de Monstier, uh, the, uh, Made, it, uh, made this black and red chalk drawing of her right hand uh, while in Rome in 1625. And while she was respected in Rome, the really big commissions, church altars and such, just didn't come rolling in. Maybe there just weren't a lot of available church altars, uh, altars at the time. Uh, she moved to Venice uh, for a few years, then Naples. And in Naples, she really settled in and started working on her first paintings in a cathedral in Pozzoli. Uh, she moved a little outside of her angry, powerful woman space and created paintings like this, which is uh, the birth of St. John the Baptist, uh, which you can see here. Uh, please note that no one is being decapitated or harassed. <laughs> Girls chilled out a little. In 1638, Artemisia joined her father in London at the court of Charles I of England, uh, where Arezio was a court painter and had the extremely important job of decorating the ceiling of the Queen's house in Greenwich. Uh, the, ceiling, uh, the ceiling is not actually at the Queen's house in Greenwich anymore, uh, much to my surprise when I went to go visit the Queen's house in Greenwich. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, at the Marlborough House, uh, in sort of uh, downtown London, where it will certainly be seen by more tourists. Uh, there's a good chance that Charles wasn't just interested in the, end, in the uh, elder Gentilici. The king had a vast collection of paintings, which included Artemisia's self-portrait as the allegory of painting with which I open this talk. Years after her arrival in London, uh, sorry, 
a year after her arrival in London, Artemisia's father died. Uh, he stuck around, she stuck around for a little bit longer to work on her own commissions and then returned to Naples just before 1642 as England was about to descend into civil war between the Roundheads and the Cavaliers. Uh, once in Naples, she continued to do some spectacular and noticeably less bloody work, like the Sleeping Venus. Again, no one being harassed or decapitated. Very chill. Um, there's a lot of debate uh, over the year of Artemisia's death. Uh, some biographers list it as 1652-53, but there's more evidence that she was taking commissions as late as 1654. Uh, either way, there's a good chance she was dead by 1656 because the plague swept through Naples and basically wiped out the entire generation of artists. So that's bad. Now, as proof that haters gotta hate, uh, this is uh, one of her, the uh, epitaphs that was written for her anonymously in 1653. By painting one likeness after another, I earned no end of merit in the world, where to carve two horns upon my husband's head, I put down the brush and took a chisel instead. Harsh. After centuries of being ignored and passed over and having her work attributed to her father, Artemisia was rediscovered in the 20th century as a great artist and also as a great feminist icon. 30 paintings by Artemisia are currently on display, like you can go see them now as part of a major exhibit in Rome's Palazzo uh, Bresci. Uh, in 2014, the recently rediscovered portrait of Mary Magdalene, uh, which you can see up here, was sold for $1.2 million. Best revenge is cash. <laughs> in 2008, the Florence Committee for the National Museum of Women in the Arts funded the restoration of, this, of her 1635 painting, David and Bathsheba, another painting about a creepy guy spying on a woman while she's bathing. Uh, the work had hung in the Grand Duke's apartment in 1652 uh, uh, and had been languishing in the Pizzi Gallery uh, storage deposits for centuries where it had been badly uh, damaged because it had been stored improperly. Finally, renewed interest in Artemisia's work has also led to closer examination of her paintings. This image uh, shows a reproduction of Susanna and the elders superimposed over an earlier version of the painting, which was made visible using x-rays. In this earlier underpainting, Susanna's pose is less beaten down and scared than raging and defiant. Her mouth is open and screaming, and she holds a knife, just as Artemisia did after her rape, to use against the men who would ruin her reputation rather their own, than their own. Artemisia's work is bought sold, examined, and debated. Agostino Tazzi's works are largely ignored. His seafaring paintings and technical perspective are considered unfashionable and boring. If he is remembered at all, he is remembered as a rapist and epic garbage person. And so I raise a glass, let's drink because the ultimate weapon of revenge is the brush, if the wielder is sufficiently talented. I didn't hear anywhere near enough callbacks for epic garbage fire, fire human. <laughs> Um, we need to work on that. It's a lot of syllables, but we can do it. Okay, so we're going to have one more talk, and then we are going to have a cocktail break. So uh, really quick, I'm going to read a couple more of these uh, entries into your own most badass moments. Uh, really quick, once when I was a waiter at a fancy restaurant, I caught a wine glass by the stem while balancing a tall tray of plates without dropping anything, which is very impressive. Um, we have another one um, that may sound familiar to, to some people in this particular city. I sold everything I owned and moved across country by myself to the most expensive city in the world where I knew no one and had no job lined up. It's fucking badass. And then um, an officious waiter told me, you can't sit here because I had sat down in a public plaza to eat ice cream, presumably because I was young and had a punk rock haircut. I stood up, smashed my cone into the table, and ran. Everyone in the plaza cheered, and for the rest of the day, people chanted, hooray, ice cream girl, whenever they saw me. 
All right, and now I would like to welcome to the stage Stuart Gripman. He is going to tell us a story not about, um, about uh, painters or badass ex-presidents. He is going to tell us about the emus of Australia and, and how they battled with their tiny brains against big guns. And as he comes up to the stage, I'm going to tell you the thing that he told us, which is that while camping in Sequoia National Park, he broke up a drunken redneck party with a pointy stick and also put out a fire with his bare hands and dirt. So please welcome Stuart to tell us about the Emu Wars. Thank you. What she didn't tell you is that those two things happened within an eight hour span and the testosterone surge lasted three weeks. It was amazing. It was the highest I've ever been. So, bringing it down a notch. Uh, what you see before you is the coat of arms of the nation of Australia. And I don't know a lot about coats of arms, but um, I imagine most countries don't put like wimpy ass animals. I don't know that anyone has a vole or a shrew on their coat of arms. And the majestic creature uh, you see on the right there is the native emu. And the emu earned its place on the coat of arms by being tough, by being fast, and by having enough power in its kick to literally shatter your bones. <laughs> but emus weren't the only badasses in Australia. Um, in the 1920s, uh, there were tens of thousands of World War I veterans who were coming back from the front, and they needed to be reintegrated into civilian society. And the Australian government wasn't so top-notch about this. Um, it's not like they just handed them a game and said, hey, welcome back, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's no, not too soon. My <laughs> oh, God, get a job. <laughs> so, so, so all these vets come back, and Australia doesn't really want to give them money or give them a whole lot of help. They do want to have more um, a, a bigger agricultural economy in the country. And if Australia has anything, it's loads and loads of land that not many people are doing not much with. So they come up with this, with this idea to help the vets by saying, hey, we'll give you, you know, a big plot of land, and as long as you farm it for a decade, it's yours to keep. Now, this was kind of the best thing going for a lot of these folks coming back from the war, so thousands of vets took Australia up, took the government up on the deal. Now, I don't know if you've ever moved to a place that was recently the domain of just wildlife. Um, I happen to live at the edge of a canyon, <laughs> I get these, this was taken in my living room. I get these visitors from time to time. Oh, no, no one's coming over for drinks, damn it. Okay, and even more, thank you, thank you. God bless you people. And even more infamously, up in the sort of northern extremes of the United States and in um, southern Canada, people have either ill-advisedly or inadvertently um, built homes on top of snake dens, subterranean snake dens. Yeah, yeah, that's real. And if you build your house in the winter over the snakes, you're going to be sleeping with them in your bed come summer. So bring it to 1932. Um, Australia's new farms had to contend with some of the locals too. Uh, and the, uh, one of the area newspapers, the Sunday Herald, put it like this, quote, the enemy is the tough, prolific, gangling marauder of the sand plains whose species has invaded, in a frenzy of hunger, some of the finest fields at the time of ripening of the harvest to shear off crops with voracious beaks. Now, to be fair, the emus weren't just being assholes. There was a drought in the interior of the country, and it was forcing them to look for new sources of water, new sources of food, and so they headed down kind of towards the southwest, towards Perth, where they found new farms with lots and lots of wheat growing, uh, reservoirs and irrigation ditches, and it was everything that they needed to survive. They're also sloppy eaters, so they trampled about twice as much as they actually ate. Um, and so the farmers were understandably pissed off. And it was compounded by the fact that the depression was setting in in Australia in 1932. Um, and the government had said, hey, keep growing, keep growing that wheat, and we're going to prop up the price. We'll give you some subsidies. And nothing ever came through. So they knew they couldn't count on the bureaucracy to help them out. And a lot of these folks were veterans, so they called up the army. They said, hey, guys. 
We've got a problem. We think there are about 20,000 six-foot-tall birds eating all of our crops. Can you help us out? And the army's like, fuck yeah, we got guns. <laughs> So they say, yeah, we'll send down a couple of detachments, uh, a couple of these. This, is, this was the uh, machine gun, you know, deluxe of the era. It's called a Lewis gun. And so the Army sent two detachments of, uh, of gunners down, and all they said was, farmers, you've got to buy the bullets. So they pulled their money, and they bought 10,000 bullets. So <laughs> November 4th, 1932, under the command of General G.P.W. Meredith, the gunners set up a position and opened fire on the emus. And apparently, they expected the emus to just stand in an orderly line and wait for death. <laughs> the emus did not do this. They scattered out of range very quickly. They broke up into smaller groups, and they can, they can run at like 30 miles an hour. So it didn't take them very long at all to get out of range. And these big, heavy guns were just, you know, plucked down in the ground. So they couldn't chase after them. And... A lot of those birds were hit with like two, three, four bullets, and they kept on running. It was like it didn't matter. They were just soaking them up. Yeah. Badass, right? So at the end of day one, with 20,000 emus wreaking havoc, they killed about 50. So they took a day off, because, <laughs> you know, that shit's hard. And Major Meredith decides, all right, we need a new plan. So we're going to set up an ambush. So he finds a place where the geography sort of funnel, would funnel the birds down into a place where they have fewer options for running and scattering and uh, waits for the birds to show up. Now, again, expectations were maybe not realistic. I think he thought the emus were just going to not notice the heavily armed bird murderers waiting for them. <laughs> They did notice the bird murders, and they stayed out of range. And so in desperation, some of the farmers actually tried to shoo the birds down towards the trap, imperiling themselves. And after half a day of this, you know, folly, uh, they managed to kill about 12 birds. The gun jammed, and they just thought, oh, what's the use? So they gave up for the day. So the next three days, Major Meredith decides, we're going to take this whole operation to the south because, and I swear to you I'm not making this up, he heard that the birds were more tame down there. So he figures, we'll go where the wuss birds are. And uh, he has, predictably, no more luck. He's, he's still not killing birds in any significant numbers. So someone has the bright idea, hey, why don't we mount the guns up on trucks? Which would kind of make sense. It seems good on paper, but remember, this is the 1930s. We've got a 1930s truck. We've got 1930s dirt farm roads in rural Australia. And we've got a World War I gun. So they really didn't have any luck with that. The birds could easily outrun the truck on those shitty roads. And even with all those slugs you know, in their bodies, they're just absorbing it and running and getting out. So we get to November 8th with 25 hundred rounds of ammo expended. The death count, is, there's no official death count, but it's probably in the neighborhood of 250 birds. The army, realizing that this is a complete fool's errand, recalls Major Meredith. But in his uh, official report for this period of the, of the, uh, of the Emu War, he, he makes sure that we, we know no army troops suffered casualties in the fighting. <laughs> God bless them. Thank you for your service. Okay, but the farmers were having none of it. They were pissed and they were desperate. So they're like, you guys, they're just dumb birds and you didn't stay long enough and you didn't try hard enough, so just come back, please. And after a few days, the army actually capitulated. They sent good old Major Meredith back with his Lewis guns and they continued their efforts for another 27 days. And in that time, nearly a month, they only managed to kill about 700 more birds and they used 7,500 rounds to... <laughs> do it. So if you're keeping track, they expended about 10 30 caliber rounds for each bird that they killed. These birds were soaking up shots like Lucille Bluth in a drinking contest. They were not going down. Okay, now to be fair, uh, they didn't exactly have SEAL Team 6 on the job. Um, the Sunday Herald Inter uh, interviewed a uh, soldier involved in the operation, and he said, quote, 
There's only one way to kill an emu. Shoot him through the back of the head when his mouth is closed or through the front of his mouth when his mouth is open. Now, it's been established on this very stage that I'm not good at math, but I'm pretty sure he just gave us two ways. And I'm certainly not a veterinarian, but I'm having trouble understanding why if you shoot an animal through its head when its mouth is closed, that's a kill shot. But if he just opens his mouth, it's a survivable wound. But it was uh, GPW Meredith who sort of put most succinctly just how badass these, these emus were when he wrote, quote, if we had a military division with the bullet carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. <laughs> they can face machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. They are like Zulus whom even dum dum bullets could not stop. And in case you're not, a dum dum bullet is like a flesh destroying, explode on impact kind of thing, and uh, you just couldn't kill him. And full disclosure, that is not GPW Meredith. I couldn't find a photo of him. That is, in fact, a soldier from the era. And I, he's pretty good looking, right? So, I mean, I'm straight, but I could get a man crush going for, uh, for that guy. So after military failure, finally, a bounty system was set up instead, which was effective in bringing the emu numbers down somewhat, but uh, it never really stopped them. And eventually, Australia turned to fencing to protect their crops from emus, and later still initiated a hunting ban so that you know, neither hunters nor farmers nor uh, army uh, soldiers can shoot at those emus. Not that they cared because you can shoot these badass birds all you like. They've earned their place on that coat of arms and you're not about to get rid of them. So, to the emus and death to Carthage. Okay, on that note, there's already a line at the bar from the people that were smart enough to quickly stand up and get in line. We are all down on glasses. So, we are going to take a short break. Um, a couple of things really quick. Um, we are building an Adventure Harvey map. If you already have an Adventure Harvey, post your photographs and hashtag them Adventure Harvey. But if you'd like to join in the fun, we have them at the table in the back. We have Adventure Harveys um, along with other things. The, um, the glasses and the buttons and the magnets and the uh, Adventure Harveys that we sell help us keep being able to do this. Um, we also have advanced discount tickets for all of our upcoming shows, the next three shows here. Um, you can see some of our Adventure Harvey uh, adventures there. He went to Antarctica over the winter break, which is amazing. Um, and this is our amazing custom Harvey for the evening. We'll be giving one away at the end of the break. So if you haven't filled out your raffle ticket, fill out a raffle ticket, drop it off over at the merch table, and we'll give one away at the end. And when we come back, we'll have the insanity of early ballooning, uh, the truth and legend of Japan's legendary fighting women, and a true story of a legendary gentleman badass, a lover, a fighter, and a rogue classical composer in the Age of Enlightenment. So go get a drink, and we'll see you back in like 15 minutes. <laughs> 